Welcome to the Woe Podcast about horses and horsemanship. I'm John Hare, and you've found the place where we talk horses. In today's show, we meet Margaret Reynolds, a seasoned equestrian and an accomplished leader in the corporate world. With a passion for horses, Margaret's experiences in endurance riding and horseback journeys around the world offer valuable insights into her resilience, goal-setting strategies, and adaptability qualities that she seamlessly translates into her successful career. We'll discover how Margaret blends horsemanship and leadership, uncovering the lessons learned from the saddle and how they shape her approach to business and personal growth. Hello, Margaret. Thanks for being on the show. John, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for asking me. Just for the audience's sake, uh, what part of the country are you in right now? I'm in the heart of the Midwest. I live in the Kansas City area on the Missouri side. And how about giving us a little bit of background, your horse history, if you would? Well, like so many riders out there, I started when I was a youth. In fact, <laughs> my mom tells me my dad bought my first pony the day I was born. And horses were kind of a jungle gym for me growing up, and my my best friend graduated to horses, and then I went off to college, had a career and a family, lived in a city, and didn't have horses for 30 years. When my mm-hmm. youngest son graduated from college, I thought, okay, what am I going to do to fill my time? They were both athletes, and I spent all my time being the road manager for their various pursuits. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy a horse. It was one of the things I loved the most. And so I did that, and I haven't looked back. And that was in 2012. So I have spent the last 10 years doing as many different kinds of fun and interesting things as I can think of to do that involve basically trail riding on steroids. (laughs) (laughs) Was it hard getting back into horses after that long layover? No, it, it's like riding a bike, you know what they say. And I think particularly because, you know, I grew up and it was so natural. I never, as a kid, it wasn't something I had to learn. It was just part of my nurturing. It was just always part of my environment. As a young person, did you do horse shows or mostly trail ride or just? No, I was in I was in 4-H. And so, you mm-hmm. know, we did projects and we did horse shows through 4-H and then We also belonged to a local pony club, and I did some of that, and then I did some showing at the state fair, but it was not at a very high level. You know, we we were a family of modest means, but we found a way to participate and have a lot of fun. But yeah, I was involved in the show world a little bit. Very cool. A mutual friend, John Zeliff, directed me to your blog post about a trip to Jordan that you took, and was this your first equestrian adventure? Oh, no. I decided in 2015 that as a bucket list item, I wanted to ride horses somewhere exotic. And so I enlisted a friend of mine, and we decided we were going to ride horses in Spain. And we recruited a total of eight women who went over and rode horses in Spain. And it was supposed to be like a one and done. We loved it so much. Some of them who didn't have horses came home and bought them. One of them bought a uh, horse farm. <laughs> it changed our lives forever, and we've been doing it ever since. So. Wait a minute. Somebody went to Spain on a horse trip and then came back and bought a horse farm? <laughs> yes. That's, <sir>. that's impressive. <laughs> that's what I call life-changing right there. They went from no horses to 10, so just be careful what you wish for, right? <laughs> You're right. And how did you decide on Spain as your first trip? Was there some magic inspiration that was was calling your name there? We picked the ride, and the ride was such an interesting mix of riding and cultural opportunities. So it was called the Dali Trail um, mm-hmm. after Salvador Dali, and it was up through the mountains. And we got to stop and see a museum that was devoted to him. We, got, we actually rode all the way across country to his home uh, and got to tour that. And so, you know, I, I had this really funny picture of our horses lined up being held by our guide and his support as we go into this museum in the middle of a, well, it's a small town, actually. You know, so they're parked like cars as we all go in and, and tour the museum. So uh, Spain Spain just had that nice mix of old world riding. And we, you know, we clip-clopped through brick-covered streets that were oh. from the 1500s and then also getting to see some of those cultural aspects. So it was really endearing. Wow. Uh, that is amazing. Was the language barrier, was that a problem for you at all? No. we 
all the guides, uh, no matter what country we've done, and we have done, did I tell you already, maybe we've done 10 of these, oh. speak English, and because that's stock and trade, sort of the international language. And even when we go, if there are other people on the ride, like I just got back from Jordan, as you said, there were four other women besides my friend and I, and they all spoke English. One was German, one was the Netherlands, and one was from England. It just sounds like an amazing experience. And then what made you decide on Jordan? Well, Jordan was really a bucket list area for my friend. She had a lifelong yearning to see Petra. Mm -hmm. And when we originally started thinking about Jordan, you could still ride horses into Petra, which you no longer can do. They do have some available you can ride once you get into Petra, but you can't make it part of your trip. But we we actually bought a, a package that allowed us to visit Petra our first day before we rode horses through and, the Wadi Rum. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm not very worldly. What, what is Petra? Petra is a ancient site that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, hmm. maybe thousands of years. And it is now recognized as, I think, one of the new seven most amazing sites in the world. Oh, wow. But it is a, a site that dates back to early civilization, earlier civilizations, and it's been partially excavated. But in addition to that, the canyons in which it's located are just breathtaking. You really ought to look it up. It's, it's I will. And, and so what kind of things did you see there? And were you riding through the desert? Was this more like a, a desert trip? or? Petra is located in more of a suburban uh, city setting. Mm -hmm. Even though it's standalone, it's what we might call a a park or a reserved area because it's a historical area. But what you begin to see is a lot of the ancient civilization, like all these huge rocks were formed from floods and lava from volcanoes. And so Mm -hmm. you see these gradations in the rock and you see such interesting, like sometimes you walk in these areas that are like, three feet wide, and, and they tower above you by, I don't know, 50 feet. Or you, you walk in areas that are 12 feet wide. You see the way they brought water down by tunneling into the sides of these walls made of stone. You see, like, all the different colors of stone due to the, all the minerals. It's just, it's just kind of breathtaking, raw nature, but combined with early-stage civilization and how they adapted it for their use. Wow. Like I said, I, I'm not very worldly. I, I think of Jordan, and I think of the Middle East, and then I think of, of deserts for some reason. So, it's, Well, they do have a lot of desert, which right. is called the Wadi Rum, which we rode through for six and a half days. Many people might relate to it if we said it's kind of like Bryce Canyon. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You've seen all those real sculptural stone walls, and you're riding under arches and narrowly between cliff sides and, and things like Petra's a little bit like that, but with a with a human influence of ancient civilization. And it sounds like there's a, a lot of riding on these trips that you take, but you're also an endurance rider too, I understand. That's correct. That's what I do for fun. Yep. And you do that, obviously, in the United States? Yes, I belong to two distance riding organizations, and there's others as well. I got started riding in um, NATRC, the North American Trail Ride Conference, which is where you you mentioned John Zeliff to me personally. Mm -hmm. He is the president of that right now, and they do distance riding, but they do it a little bit differently. They follow different rules and protocol. And then the other one is that I'm doing is called the American Endurance Ride Conference, and theirs is longer distances, and the first one I mentioned is a paced ride. You finish so many miles within a window. Mm -hmm. The second one is you can ride it like a ride. Your goal is to finish, but you can't. it is a race. Whatever horse crosses the finish line first, fit to continue, which is important, wins the race. And they have different distances. They go up to 100 miles in a day. In the second example, you don't want to spend your horse to win the race. That's right. Mm-hmm. You have to be fit to continue, or you can be pulled at the end, which is a travesty. That just requires so much uh, physical and mental toughness. Do you recall any uh, funny or unexpected moments from a, a race or a competition? I, I can't say that there's been a whole, whole lot of funny ones. There are, <laughs> certainly have been a lot of unexpected challenges met, whether it's finding riders who have gotten off their horses I should say unplanned dismounts. We all know what those are. <laughs> right. 
And, you know, you come across them and you have to help them catch their horse or help them get back on or things like that. But probably the, the, the hardest one for me at any point is when you aren't able to complete a ride. And I, my, one of my early rides, you know, you have to be able to read the trail, which is marked, and I misread the trail, and I did an extra 19-mile loop. And instead of riding 25 miles, I rode 40 miles, and we came in way over time. And that was a, quite a lesson. There's a saying that says you either win or you learn. <laughs> I've learned a lot. <laughs> put it that way. Uh, yeah, that's ama- that's just amazing. Gosh darn. So yeah, you just took one wrong turn and boom, you're off the off track. Yeah. And did you find your way back? Did you backtrack or did you just stumble across the... I did. I back- I figured out I was wrong and I backtracked and I ran into two other riders who had more experience than I did and they go, oh no, this is right. So they got lost with me. And because then we went on the whole loop and then we ended up, we did find our way back to camp, but we were late. Yeah, that, you know, for me, sometimes that's the worst feeling is that I've led others to the learning experience along with me, you know. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's all right. Like I said, sometimes you learn more from your mistakes than from your from your wins anyway. How about during your equestrian adventures? Were there any uh, unpredictable situations during that or any anecdote you can pass along? Oh my, (laughs) where do I begin? We've had so many different ones. I'll give you a couple of examples. My very first one in Spain, I at the time was riding a quarter horse. I ride an Arabian now and the quarter horse I rode was 16 hands, which, you know, isn't huge by today's standards, but it's Mm -hmm. not small. And they had a larger horse and they said, does anyone mind riding this larger horse? And I said, I don't mind. I ride a larger horse at home. So I got on top of a almost 17-hand Andalusian, who at the time, I did not know, was five years old and had never been on the trail. Oh, no. I only learned that later. So at any rate, we are getting mounted. Okay, this is my very first time I've ever done this. We're getting mounted in a grassy field about, a oh, not even a quarter of a mile from the stables, but it's up an asphalt road. And somebody cracks a water bottle. And the horse was grazing, which means the reins were loose, because I was already mounted and I was waiting for others to mount. And that horse lifted up its head and then in a split second bolted for the stables. And I tried with all my might to try to stop that horse. I thought the last thing I need is to hit a horse wearing shoes and studs on asphalt road. That right. just, so I had to kind of reach way down, you know, get in a jockey position to get hold of it and do like the old one rein stop. And I was so glad. If anyone doesn't know the one rein stop, <laughs> please learn it. Because you never know when you might need it. But that horse continued to bolt on. They kept saying, oh, we'll get you another horse if you're not happy. Well, I rode that horse. He probably bolted on me two or three more times that same day. Oh, wow. And the point that it, it became funny in a way. And they didn't give me another horse. So <laughs> he was a horse for the whole week. <laughs> You know, and the funny thing is, he was you know, this big old huge horse, 17 hands. His name is, was Timmy, like as if, as if he was timid or something. Right. <laughs> he just wasn't very trail experienced, we'll put it that way. Oh, wow. Well. I've been on a horse that's 14 hands and bolted, and that seems pretty fast. And then I've also been on Frisian, who was 17 hands, and that was a casual lope. And that seemed faster than the little horse's bolt. So I can't imagine what... <laughs> That big, massive horse was was bolting. How you even got it stopped? What a ride, yeah, huh? We did. We talked about the horses. What about maybe cultural differences that may have occurred? You know, when you're riding in a different, in a foreign country, was there any stories from uh, misunderstandings or directions that you got from it? I'm a big. I will say this: the horses are horses, meaning, yes, the breeds may vary. And one of the things we love is we try to always ride indigenous horses, which means if we're going to be in the desert, like the Sahara or Jordan, we'd love to ride Arabians. If we're in India, we rode Marwaris, which is a fascinating breed. If you aren't familiar with them, you ought to look them up. And then when we were in Africa, we rode thoroughbred and Broa per crosses, which is their native horse. So that's been one of the delights is getting to experience a wide range. But I would say that it's not so much that, the, but horses, spirits, horses, mentalities, horses, behaviors are not dissimilar across mm-hmm. countries or, or breeds. I mean, they still respond in much of the same ways, right? They respond to pressure. They respond, mm-hmm. they're prey animals. They have all those same kind of things. 
So you need to be adaptable to the horse that you're riding, but at the same time, most of the things that have been what I would call mishaps or misunderstandings that were culturally based were really human Mm -hmm. off. Like, for example, in Jordan, one of the gals who came along who was from the Netherlands, beautiful young lady, and she had some difficulty interpreting the language, so when the, into English, it was not her first language. So when the guide said, what kind of horse would you like? She said, I'd like a strong horse. And to her, meaning a brave horse. So he gave her a mount that was, was a very strong mover at the canter and needed a really strong hand to manage it mm-hmm. because it just wanted to run. And she got on that horse the first day, and she could not stop that horse when we cantered. So as the day wore on, it became apparent that this was not going to be a good fit. And I was assigned the sweet little gray Arabian, probably 14, one or two, that had easy to rate. And I said, you know, for the rest of the day, I'm not uncomfortable, reference back to my first experience riding with the runway. <laughs> right. I'm not uncomfortable riding a stronger horse, so I'll, I'll switch with her for this afternoon while you sort things out. So he said, thank okay. you. So we did that. And so he was very hard to stop, even for someone and I won't say like I'm the best writer in the world, but even for someone who's had experience in a variety of situations, he was very hard to stop. Uh So the next day, the guide came back to me and said, I'm going to give her one more chance. There's a possibility she could be sent home. And I would encourage anyone who does one of these trips, and I hope you do, is to seek one out that is for your particular riding ability and interest. I tend to go with advanced rides, but some people probably should be cautious because they mean what they say when they say, can you canter in all situations? <laughs> like in Africa, we had one rider who was dismissed because, you know, your life is at stake. If you can't outrun a charging hippo, which by the way, we had to do, then you probably shouldn't be riding. But anyway, in this particular case, I got on this horse and he said, I'll give her one more morning. And she did much better. And so he said, okay, well, I'm going to keep her on that horse, and you're going to keep, you're going to have to stay on this horse. And I'm like, oh gosh. He goes, we're going to bit him up a little bit, a little easier to control. And it turned out that those were the right horses for both of us. I had the pleasure of because we did get to gallop at full speed, and I had the fastest horse, which I love. I like love speed, yeah. and she had a very nice, rateable, gentle, happy to canter at the back of the pack kind of ride. So yeah. you know, all things end well. But yes, there can be cultural misunderstandings. I had the pleasure of interviewing Keith Swenson of Stone Horse Expedition, who does rides in Mongolia. And oh, he that's would, on our bucket list. Is it on your bucket list? I'd love to do it, yeah. Right. With, the, with the recent uh, health issues, I'm not sure I'm ready for it yet, but we'll see. Yeah, he's, he's just a beautiful country. He shared mm-hmm. with us some photos on some of his rides, and it's just truly amazing. But I have to go back to, you had to outrun a hippo in Africa? Oh, yeah. Well, that was not me. Oh, okay. We were starting off on our adventure that morning, and they usually tied a saddlebag onto some horse, and it carried apples for our break. And they had tied it on my friend's horse, and she had asked for a last-minute saddle change. So they ripped the saddle off, changed the saddle, you know, put the saddlebag back on and off we went. And we saw two hippos, a male and a female, in a pond, and we kept getting closer. One of the beauties of doing these rides in Africa on horseback is we are animals. And so, you know, when they look up and look around to say, okay, is that a threat? Well, we just let our horses graze. And then as they go back to doing whatever they're doing, we kind of take 10 steps forward, and then we drop our head and graze. And so right. we can get closer. We're not a threat or perceived usually. Well, this particular hippo wanted to have that female hippo all to himself at some point. So we got a little close, and he just, and you probably have heard this, hippos are actually a lot faster than you think. He came roaring up and out of the water at a speed that we didn't anticipate, and he said, run. So everybody turned tail on their horses and ran, which my friend did as well, but they had forgotten to tie her saddlebags down completely, and so they were flapping on the back of the horse. Think about that, right? You're riding a prey animal who sees a charging hippo and something is flapping on their flanks. What do you think that horse did? (laughs) Fucked her off. So now she's on the ground and she's wearing a GoPro. She's on the ground running as fast as she can. The guide gets between us and the hippo and eventually the hippo, he's got the hippo, he warns him off. And (laughs) actually with his voice, he didn't even have to resort to like like a, a bear. A lot of times I'll shoot a bear blank. Um, But he just, you know, shouted at him and he stopped. He saw us retreating. 
And so she was able to get back on her horse, and I took the saddlebags on my horse because she's like, I'm having nothing to do with those saddlebags. <laughs> <laughs> and her GoPro is so funny because it, you could – even though she's the one running, she can't see herself. You can see her shadow. You can see her shadow running as fast as her little heart could take her, you know, away from the incident. So, yeah, that's that's the hippo story. It's mm-hmm. fun in retrospect. But for the time, it was somewhat alarming. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of those stories might take a little time to develop into funny. Uh, at the time, they yeah. could be quite harrowing. I'm sure part of the reason that you take these trips is to get away from civilization and reflect on the real world. What do you find you come back with? Any ideas and and creativity? Do you think that helps with that? Well, yes. And there's so many different ways it helps with that. So one of the ways is I am a, I'm a Christian. And so for me, it's a spiritual experience. You're riding through the desert that people were in thousands of years ago, or you visit Mount Nebo, or you go to places in Egypt where there's a history there that so far exceeds anything we know in the United States right. that it, it almost transcends time, because you're out in the middle of nowhere, right? You're not in civilization, so you can almost imagine what it was like to be present years and, and centuries ago. So that's one thing, is a real steep, real deep spiritual reflection. Um, the second thing is you come away understanding how much we have and how much we waste, because we're riding, typically in these rides, we're riding in more rural areas. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing countries the way people really live. And if you're talking about India or Jordan or Morocco, they, they don't in the countryside live anywhere close to the way we live. And right. it makes you so much more appreciative, and to some extent, I'm going to use the word ashamed, of what we do and what we have and what we demand for ourselves. And then the last piece is, as a business consultant, I'm always looking for what can I take away from this journey that I can translate into business and leadership principles. Because when you're riding a horse, you're the leader of the horse, but you're also engaging in a journey, if you will, or an experience where you don't have to complete control. Just like in a business, you cannot control what's going on around you. You can't control the economy. You can't control competition. You can't control technology. So how do you adapt? How do you develop a plan or a strategy to get the maximum outcome while still being adaptable to that which you are not in control of? And horseback riding is the same way. You want to have a great experience, but as you've heard me talk, things can go (laughs) the wrong way. So how do you make the most of that? And so all those things, I think, are great takeaways. It certainly makes me feel like I come home a better person than when I left. I do think that one other aspect might be the perspective, because you're seeing a different part of the world through the local people, and you get to see their perspective And we don't always get to see that here in this country. And much like you mentioned, our 200 plus years of history is nothing compared to the 2000, the 10 10x factor of some of those older uh, civilizations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In India, we actually camped a lot of nights in India, but don't feel bad for us. It was not bad camping. We had like those safari tents with the flags on top, you know, Mm -hmm. and they had We didn't sleep on the ground in sleeping bags. We had these little makeshift beds. But whoever the local head of the village was would come out, usually and greet us in sort of a ceremonial fashion. It was fascinating because many of them had never seen Caucasians and certainly not women Caucasians. So one morning we were invited into the home of the local village leader, and all the townsmen came, and they... They served us tea, and it was like an experience I'll never forget because it was two cultures. We couldn't talk to each other, but they let us hold their children and shared tea. And, you know, you wouldn't get that if you just had a tour of the major cities. It's like having people come to New York and L.A. and Las Vegas and saying, okay, we've seen the States, right? Right, right. That's amazing. Just when you said they hadn't seen a Caucasian woman, that... It's hard to fathom that. There are places in the world like that. That is truly fascinating. In all your adventures, was there a favorite or memorable horse that, from a particular country that, other than the ones that you've told us about? 
Well, I will tell you that for a variety of reasons, I think that India was probably my favorite trip, even though I've enjoyed them all. Mm -hmm. I can't say I didn't have any that I didn't like. But India, because of the diversity of the culture, we were there longer and really got to explore. So, you know, we did the Taj Mahal and we we, we got to go to a, a horse fair where they were showing the Marwari horse and they're warrior horses and they're the ones that will dance on their back feet and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we got to do all of this, rode on a sleeper train, everything you think you should do when you're in India, right? right. Plus go through all these villages and have these personal experiences that we got to have. But the horse I rode was a Marwari. Uh, it was a mare, and I am partial to geldings. But she was probably the perfect horse. She walked out. I, I love a forward horse. She walked out, but she was so rateable. She responded to cues. She just was one of those horses that you just felt like, oh, this is kind of magical. You know, wow. we were just getting along so well. So I, I really enjoyed that horse. That's pretty neat to have that bond. How long was that India trip? Three weeks. We spent oh um, we spent eight days in the saddle of that three weeks, and of course you can imagine the travel to and from was a bit of the time as well. Yeah, right. Do you have plans for future trips? Oh, absolutely. We are, we're going to France this fall in September and riding in the Morvan Reserve. It's in the southeastern, well, central southeastern part of France, but it's a big reserve area, so it's been preserved. So there's going to be a lot more forests, small villages. It's not going to be like the France that most people know. Let's go to Paris, you know. Let's go to the French Riviera. No, it's going to be very much the pure nature and the small villages and things that we've come to know and love so much. Very cool. And do you have any suggestions for people who might, be inspired to take a trip like this as far as planning how far ahead do you need to plan where you might investigate a trip like these i do so we started off with using brokers and there's many of them there are some located in the united states or some located in england one of our the, our guide in africa started his own and then he moved back to england and so we used him for our africa trip so it's really interesting that there are many and I would just go out and Google horse adventures or horse trips in X country and they'll come up. I don't know that I this I don't want to make this out of a commercial right. of which ones are best, but you'll find that there's a number of them and I've I have found them all to be reputable, the ones that we've used. And if you you want to do that because what they offer usually are trips that they have vetted. So right. they won't send you on a trip that they haven't vetted. A lot of problems is when people find the actual stable, then you don't know their safety record. You don't know the quality of their horses. Like, do they care for their horses? Do they feed them well? Because you don't want to ride a, a horse right. that's <laughs> suffering, or, you know, that kind of thing. So that's why we go through brokers. But then after we started doing this a little while, we gave, came to know some of the guides, and we have been able to reach back out to the guide directly or we through our encounters we talk to the other riders and say well which ride have oh. you enjoyed if they're on a ride that we like and they like and that's their style too then we can compare notes and say well then you better do this trip or this trip kind of thing i would say just google a broker first i would focus on broker or in english speaking like england so in the united states there's one called equators in england there's one called far and ride there's as i said there's a whole bunch of them and I think I've had an interview with a couple, so I'll put the links to those in the show notes here, and people can check those out as possible candidates. Are there any particular questions that someone might need to ask that would be really essential for a trip like this? Well, I think a couple things. One, how much work you want to do. Like, do you want to be the one that saddles your horse and grooms your horse and mm -hmm. feeds your horse? Or do you want all that taken care of? There's two different kinds of rides. There's what they call center-based rides, where you go to a stable and you do day trips out and back. Or we don't like those. We like the point-to-point. -point. We like to travel. Mm -hmm. So usually we stay in B&Bs. On occasion, we have camped. But 
mostly we like to be able to take a shower at the end of the day, so we kind of like the, the ones where we stay in, in B&Bs. And they're usually little guest houses that are very reflective of the culture. Mm-hmm. So they're always clean and friendly, and you're well-fed, and we have great entertainment in the evening, whether we're singing or dancing to the, some of the local music or what have you. We really like that kind of thing a lot. But that's our jam, and it may not be everyone's. Right. I would say you have to be brutally honest with yourself about your skill level because you don't want to get in over your head, or you could get sent back. So don't take on more than than you can chew. And if you're not sure, err on the side of understatement, and that would will keep you safe, I think. Would you agree that it's a good uh, rule of thumb that if it's your first trip, that maybe you don't pick a three-week ride, you start with something a little bit shorter and, and kind of gain experience that way? I don't think the distance is much of a factor as the fit. So if okay. if you want to be out there for three weeks, if you've chosen the right ride, you know, the right kind of horse, level of horse, accommodations and things that you want to do, I think that's fine. Now, if you don't, if you're not, you, like I'm used to riding a lot of miles, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't get sore in the saddle really on any of these, but some people could or will if they're going to ride longer. Most trips are a week because that's what people seem to want to do. You know, right. people take vacations okay. for a week. And so most most rides are usually six days allowing for you to get there the night before, ride six days and then leave. That's pretty typical. If you have a longer trip, you've usually made it a custom trip. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, thank yeah. you, Margaret, for sharing. That. I'm sure there will be people inspired by your adventures to try I this. on so. the. I think everybody should do it at least once. Yeah, it's a great experience, it sounds like. I've enjoyed every minute of it and will continue to do it as long as I can. Wow. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day and sharing these adventures. Well, you're very welcome. It's been my privilege to get to relive them with you. That wraps up another fantastic episode. A huge thanks to Margaret Reynolds for joining us and sharing her amazing horse stories from around the world. She's had some incredible adventures, both here and abroad. If you're curious to learn more about her rides in India, Jordan, and Spain, I recommend checking out her blog post. She also has an article in the Outdoor Journal titled, Riding Through Rajasthan. Trust me, it's an exciting read as she rides an indigenous Marwari horse. You'll find all the handy links over at woepodcast.com. But be warned, once you've read about her adventures, you'll be itching to embark on your own. Speaking of connections, a big shout out to John Zeloff, a good friend and avid listener of the show. He introduced us to Margaret. We're always on the lookout for fascinating guests. So if you know someone who'd be a perfect fit, give us a shout. And of course, as always, we want to hear from you. Got an awesome horse story to share or a cool experience you've had? We're all ears. Shoot an email to john at woepodcast.com or connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram under the name Woe Podcast. It's great to hear from you. Once again, a sincere thank you for listening and sharing the podcast with your pals and writing buddies. You guys rock. Until next time, for Renee, this is John Hare saying, go have some fun with your horses. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.